To clarify something real quick, this is not a Borderlands channel. This is just a channel run by a person that thoroughly enjoys Borderlands. To reinforce that idea, I wanted to play something unrelated. I also wanted to play the third game, because I haven't really gotten a chance to in a while. So in that spirit, I'm not playing Borderlands 3. Iron Cub is. Now, you don't normally start the game with your action skill, but you can. You can essentially skip to level 13, which certainly makes things easier, but also isn't particularly fun. So with that knowledge, I'm allowing slide kicks up until Moses level 2. I reset the area repeatedly to avoid any actual progress until the cub could get to work. As the newest member of the Raiders, I am being entrusted to take this base as a new place of operation for the barely together Crimson Raiders. Aside from Claptrap, I have no idea where the other Raiders currently are. But it's a good thing this particular perfect stranger is trustworthy. While I accompany Iron Cub on this murder spree, I'd like to clarify the rules I'm running by. This is an Iron Cub run, so Iron Cub is the only thing that can deal damage unless it's required, such as objects that need to be destroyed for plot reasons. In those cases, guns and melee are allowed, but only as necessary. Or for normal combat, any gear that deals damage, grenades, guns, melee, ground pounds, slide kicks, cars, turrets, and even bouncing on enemies are all banned. Driving and sliding are both fine, but not if I hit into an enemy or object that I don't need to. As usual, I won't be held accountable for environmental or NPC-based damage. That's on them, and I couldn't reliably stop them if I tried. Guardian ranks would be out if I had them unlocked at the moment, but I don't, so that's not a concern of mine. Because world drops are a thing, and farming is weird, I'm outright banning unique gear. It's just a simpler solution to things like legendary class mods. I also didn't use any anointed gear. Not strictly a rule, I just didn't have any at any point. Should I accidentally break these rules, I'll be resetting the area to try again. This time with feeling! I rescued the most divisive robot in the series, kill the leader around these parts, and Lilith shows up to actually contribute to something. There's time for everything, I guess. In case it's not apparent, Iron Cub does shockingly high amounts of damage. It absolutely shreds through health bars, but it also has a ludicrously long cooldown. So any fight that requires more than one Cub is less than ideal. There really isn't a great way for me to improve said cooldown, but the duration will at least eventually get better. You may be asking, though. Iron Bear only has already been done. What makes Iron Cub so different? I submit to you, the Iron Cub AI in all of its glory. Its single, busted up line of code glory. It's great when it works, which is... sometimes. The rest of the time it can't figure out what to do. So this is gonna be fun. Turns out some random bandits have the vault key, which is of course my problem now. After some goofing off, I save Vaughn from Tales from the Borderlands. I suppose it's nice to see him back, but it'd be even better if his personality was still intact. I then have to go get access to a vehicle from Ellie, and why can't she do that herself? Alternatively, why can't Ellie let me use the catch ride? What are either of these characters doing while I go get a car? Not to sound selfish, but what the actual fuck are the Crimson Raiders doing to help me? At the moment, I'm the only one doing anything as far as I can tell. I had my sweet child defend me as I made my escape with a car. I'm not saying it was hard, I'm saying it was annoying. If her business is literally digestructing cars, how the hell does she not have a car I can use? I make my way to an area that's constantly blaring the worst sounds known to man. Now, I get that there is a stereotype of the over-the-top cringy crap from creators, but like, none of them are the main antagonist of any interactive story. Or at least, any good ones. There are many fundamental issues with the Calypso twins as villains, but they're supposed to be intimidating villains, no? From where I'm sitting, they seem like spoiled, self-serving assholes. Jack absolutely fit that same bill, but there's a key difference. The characters within Borderlands 2 reacted very strongly to this. Regularly. Within fiction, it's important that the world reacts to its inhabitants. If something is absolutely vile, you need to make sure the people observing it feel more strongly about this than the audience. I'm constantly wondering why the hell they were written so poorly, but the characters in the game hardly ever address it. Now if you're asking, but then wouldn't every line of dialogue be devoted to how bad they are as villains and contributing members of the plot? Yes. That would be every line from every character always. But here's the thing. Following that rule, at some point, maybe, fucking maybe, Someone on the team would stop to consider if any reasonable person would hate to hear these voices for the next several hours. Maybe they shouldn't be constantly in your ear. They do a great job of making you hate them, but not because they're evil, not because they're scary, not because they're anything other than a constant annoyance that nobody will ever address. I get that a lot of fans of the series hate Claptrap, but so does almost every person in the game. You're at least not in solitude suffering through this crap. He's called out. He's kicked around. He's not constantly racking up wins all the while the players want nothing more than for him to shut the fuck up, Tyreen! I just... how did this get past a team of professional writers? A lot of the time I favored simply running through the area because staying to fight is... slow. I can't revive myself, but Iron Cub can get kills, which is close enough. So I sometimes would throw it out and head for the hills as fast as my military could mill a carry. Cause... Cause Moses is a soldier. Knowing the Tyreen can teleport, she just kind of left the vault key with this guy. So I'ma kill him and take it back. 
To do that, though, I have to face down another absolutely garbage decision that went into making this game a reality. Seriously, it's both fun and a constant headache. I just don't understand how this game happened the way that it did. Pretty much every boss has stages to their health bar. When reduced to a certain point, they become invulnerable for what is way longer than even somewhat reasonable. It more or less just runs out the clock on Iron Cub, so this fight took three uses of my action skill to kill him once. Doesn't sound so bad until you realize that the cooldown is a minute 40. I had to just run in circles for over a minute and a half between every use. Just so his stupid fucking invincibility could run out. Because that's fun gameplay, isn't it, Gearbox? Could be worse, though. I could die like an idiot and have to restart. Good thing I'm not that bad at games, right? I know it really isn't that long in the grand scheme of things, but it's just a whole lot of nothing. I get so many mandatory breaks in gameplay and it's dreadful. I just want to do the thing. Let me leave. I get the map back and the Sun Smashers are apparently pretty toxic. No, Sun Smashers never cry. Krang is human, my man. Nothing to be ashamed of. Lilith gives the map back to me to take to her Iridian expert Tannis rather than teleport it there herself. You know, because she can do that. I then have to defend the place from bandits because of course I do. For the record, there are no repercussions for not doing so. I had to wait for my cub to come back, so, you know. Then Lilith shows up anyway to do my job for me. Remind me, why am I here again? To drive a car, I guess. I have to run some enemies over for a mission objective and get a ship part that nobody else could be fucking bothered. Oh, Lilith is being attacked. If you're telling me that they can't teleport, then seriously, how the fuck did they get here? Especially without anyone noticing. Why does Lilith even have the map on her right now? She was allegedly going and getting crew members. Also, she doesn't have a gun on her? On Pandora? And does literally nothing to meaningfully protect herself from these two with the full knowledge that she can fucking teleport. She can teleport other things. She could literally just teleport them to some far off hellscape and then come back. Unless Tyreen can teleport, which I don't think is supposed to be canon. Her status as a siren though is stolen because plot. She didn't even fucking try to prevent anything that just happened. I just, I can't. There is a point at which belief can be suspended no longer. Who the flying fuck wrote this trash? The writers are trying as hard as our fearless leader, which is to say they fucking aren't. Also, despite her powers taking two and a half games to finally kind of get down, Tyreen is able to steal the whole Firehawk thing and has instant perfect control over where she sends people. I lost it once. I won't lose it again. You lying bitch! Despite my best efforts, Iron Cub saves Lilith and I'm forced to accompany them to Promethea, by which I mean my only consistent companion is my Minimac. I met up with Lore, one of the better additions to the game, methinks. Turns out the company Malawan is sponsoring some streamers. They're trying to bring down Atlas, which... Well, now I'm doing everything for the Raiders and Atlas. Corporate war and all that. There are a weirdly high number of encounters that look like this. I can't really do anything, but the game throws NPC companions at you like candy. Shitty candy, though, since most of them really can't do much damage and you have to do everything yourself anyway. I can't quite put my finger on why, but this took forever. Turns out Reese is back, also from Tales from the Borderlands. I suppose it's nice to see him back, but it would be even better if his personality was intact. Zero is also back because at some point in the making of this game, they became a lot more interested in bringing in new and familiar characters than developing any of them. Despite being one of the most dangerous people in the galaxy, I can confirm that Zero is also terrible at dealing damage. He eventually gets us through the goalposts, though. I help him to upgrade his sword and he immediately betrays me. The audacity! This is the fun part. Is it though? Is it really? So I got another boss fight here, where the last time my big issue was invincibility, this time my issue is the boss cheating. This game is a lot buggier than I remember. Not only did my mech not spawn, but it can't despawn, so my action skill cannot cool down. Thanks, game. I reloaded everything so I could actually combat the fucker, and it took one, one cub. Ah, ah, ah. Two, two cubs. Ah, ah, ah. Three, three cubs. Ah, ah, ah. Seven. The answer is seven fucking cubs. I don't want to talk about it. I steal the boss's brain, which is apparently used as a data storage unit for Malawan's information. Listen, I have no idea why. I don't even work here. We then exploit a desperate man whose life is currently falling apart to further our own needs. I then head to Sanctuary through one loading screen, only to travel to Athenus because fast travel isn't enabled across planets for reasons that I'm not going to pretend for a second that I understand. To get to Athenus, I have to go through another loading screen. I bring this up because hot damn does this game have loading screens. Set a course for Athenus, Vault Hunter. Why can't you even do that for yourself? I have to do everything around here, including flying the fucking ship. I get planet side where I meet Maya from Borderlands 2. She's actually really in character. I'm glad to see her back. It's a good thing that they managed to not butcher one returning character. I do have to ask though, why did most of the raiders basically just fuck off? 
I get that it gives the game sort of a getting the gang back together feel, but it really didn't even do that right. It just makes me wonder where people like Brick went, given how gung-ho he was about hunting all of the other vaults at the end of 2, and now he's nowhere to be seen. He called dibs! Just gotta clear these enemies out. Any minute now. You're free to do something. Anything? Please? You're just gonna sit there for the full duration, aren't you? I hate this fucking AI. I carried on and met up with the corpse, which is a better character than this shit stain. I know it's not a controversial opinion, but that's not a personality. Catchphrases don't make for good characters. They might make them more memorable, but in the wrong fucking way. I don't want to remember how obnoxious your sorry ass is. Let's kill these guys, then loot them. I don't understand this game's obsession with loot. Yes, it's a looter shooter. Yes, it's nice to get new gear. But the best parts of the gameplay, I think, comes from the variety brought by the playable characters. In the second game, anyone can pick up a herald and go to town. Anyone can grab a bee and whatever. But only Maya can pull everything to one spot for shit like cloud kill without using a grenade. Only Krieg can blood explode. You sure as heck you ain't using boar with Axton. Shut the fuck up about loot, and why the hell didn't we get more vault hunters? Oh my god. You should see a doctor about that. Iron Cub, help. Please, help. I can't move. Please just kill us so I can leave. Are you seriously gonna let this little abomination be more helpful than you? What the fuck? Despite being on the mysterious and mystical planet of Athenus, I had this constant ringing in my ear. Almost like a terribly thought out character was about to become not only recurring, but central to the plot, while also only giving me a really shitty linear shooting gallery. This guy tries to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Iron Cub and... Oh. Oh no. Holy shit. I... Well, that works. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, he's fucking dead. Now that we've fended off a single attack, Maya is going to be leaving her planet behind to help us. Leaving Athena completely defenseless. I said she was in character. I didn't say the writing got any better. We take the MacGuffin to Sanctuary, and we're back to Promethea. Glad I had to add an extra loading screen there. I sure am glad that one of the most complex and compelling characters from the spin-off game has been reduced to a series of catchphrases and really poorly written jokes. Also, now that I'm here, load screen. Because I couldn't just come straight here, that would have been far too convenient. Do you want the same enemies but with lower gravity? Too bad, that's exactly what you get. I'm here to shut down a discount Death Star. I canonically took a Malawan ship to get here, but decided to land ages from any of the controls or, you know, anything even remotely important. Good choice, as always. I'm glad that a ton of the fights on the way here are only MANDATORY! I eventually made it into a totally not boss arena where I had to clear out a bunch of enemies and questioned laws and ethics. What are corporations considered for the purpose of war crimes? Because I just shot what is potentially a civilian craft with an unknown number of people in it. Sure, it's owned by a guy that was also just haphazardly shooting random people, but the people on the yacht weren't necessarily combatants. Is there a space version of the Geneva Convention? What? There's a boss here? There's no possible way that I could have seen this coming. Just a, just a boss in the last part of a linear map in a large and mostly empty room? Well, I'll be. Just imagine my surprise. It wasn't the fastest fight in the world, but on my second mech, it, uh... Not really sure what happened there. I stopped paying attention for a moment and it was over. I guess it auto-crits on the final shield? Like, fucking hell. To commemorate the occasion, I grabbed a vault key piece. Because I guess this game is sort of about vaults? And went to load screen. I mean, sanctuary. The raiders get upset that Reese apparently has a part of the vault key and didn't say anything until now, but... He's also just giving it to us for our recent help. Help that also got us another vault piece. That we did specifically to get that piece. This is just a bonus and a really kind gesture. I then have to go back to Promethea to pick it up. Of course, nothing can be that easy, though. Gotta pat out that playtime somehow. Sounds like Zero's turned traitor and is attacking Atlas, and I'm not gonna lie. Soldier, don't you dare use your last words to slander Zero. Say you're being murdered by someone else. I thought this line was actually pretty funny. There really aren't many, and I wanted to point this one out. And then of course, that flaw thread is pretty instantly resolved by the actual Zero showing up to expose the fake Zero with zero hesitation so everyone could say Zero- Oh, that explains things! Staring down the barrel of a Metal Gear Snake situation. His whole explanation for this whole misunderstanding though is weak as heck. He just didn't say anything for no real reason, and let people believe that he was killing his own comrades. Could've just mentioned it before he vanished? Also, the why the fuck is Katagawa here as an assassin? The dude is literally the CEO of a massive organization. Why bother putting himself in the line of fire? How did he replicate Zero's abilities via tech? Is it really that easy to make someone that dangerous that his own friends can't tell the difference? If that's the case, what the hell is the point of literally the rest of his company? They're a weapons company that also has a military. 
The Vault Hunters in this game are pretty much all one-person armies, so why not make things cheaper and just outfit single soldiers with your ridiculously effective zero tech? Sure, it's not as good as a real Vault Hunter, but it's close enough. Also, why does searching for a random container that may or may not exist make you a terrifying force of nature? The series treats Vault Hunters like they're all super powerful, but by definition it's literally just someone searching for a vault. Also, Katagawa's dead. Easy as killing a spoiled rich murderer. Reese mustache about his facial hair, and I personally don't like it. But body positivity is important, and I want him to feel both happy and content with himself. He says he wears it for others, but it's also for him, and for his own joy. Rock that mustache, man. Live your best life, and let nobody stand in your way. Back to the loading screen. I mean, sanctuary. And we're off to open a vault. I remember when that was a bigger deal than it is now. Cool swords are handy. So is basic AI pathing. I'd like to clarify that I'm not attacking anyone here. Maya is. After a close call, I'm treated to the main antagonist just making fart jokes. I get that they were scraping the bottom of the barrel here, but I'm pretty sure they've already passed through any of the wood that was left. If everything in your story is a joke, then nothing is. Did we learn nothing from Syndrome? We finally get to open a vault, and the monster inside sucks. Am I supposed to be intimidated by this? I understand that vault monsters are supposed to be canonically more terrifying than things like Terramorphous, but gotta say, this thing just isn't. You're telling me Maya killed the other and now hardly scratches this thing? There are basic enemies that are more intimidating. After spending way too long and way too many mechs in a crappy bolt at hell, the creature goes down and corpse shows up. I mean, Ava. I get to go inside the vault, which looks alright, I guess. They at least wouldn't copy and paste this exact layout into every vault in the game, right? Yeah, did I say in character? Because Maya's character goes completely out the fucking window here, where she kind of just forgets all of her training, her experience, her powers, and just lets herself die. What the flying fuck is the player character doing during all of this? There are potentially four of them all just twiddling their thumbs. I genuinely don't have the words to explain how upset I was the first time I saw the cutscene, and how upset I still am. Maybe I'm just biased because I love her character, but this was such a fucking show of disrespect to her. Sure, the plot also fucked Lilith's entire character, but Maya? Fuck off! I'm gonna be a sire, and then I'm gonna mop the floor with assholes like you! In 1 to 50 business years, I'm gonna have a means of defending myself, and as long as you do literally nothing to prevent this until it occurs, you're fucked! Wait, how is that a threat? Insult to injury, I have to go back to Sanctuary. She keeps pulling this I'm ready bullshit, but she's what, five? Then has the audacity to blame literally everyone but herself for the death of her mentor and caretaker with the full knowledge that she literally died because of Ava's presence. And Lilith also blames Lilith? I just don't fucking understand how this got past a writing team. Everyone has a different way of coping. A child lashing out makes sense. Deflecting blame makes sense. But it's insufferable to hear from a character that has no redeeming traits. And to hear the fucking leader around these parts being so unsure of herself that a child throwing a tantrum is enough to shake her resolve. Also, I can't take anything that's happened even halfway seriously, because the overall tone of this game is fucking fart jokes. And what's the other bookend? It's whatever the devs think is a funny haha -ha meme video. How the fuck is this the same studio that gave us Handsome Jack? The first time I ever played this, I legitimately didn't think she was dead. I thought it was a crappy fake out. I didn't think they would give any character a death that unceremonious. It wasn't just a failure on the writing team. It was animated terribly. There is nothing interesting happening. She's there and then she's not. What the fuck? And we're off to one of the worst planets in the game. It's massive with not much to do or see. My favorite. Bright side, this game adds what is quite possibly the single best character added in this game. In Wainwright Jacobs. This man is a bloody fucking legend. Also, best couple. I enjoy Hammerlock as a character in general. These two are the only thing that make this planet worth getting through. His partner was kidnapped though, so first I gotta sort that out. Turns out, Brick is here. I suppose it's nice to see him back, but it'd be even better if his personality was intact. Also, Tina's back. I really like her in Borderlands 2. The chaotic energy somehow manages to be heartfelt and complex, while also being generally amusing. Instead of being another series of jokes held together by a cast of characters that are indistinguishable from one another because wouldn't it be great if it was non-stop jokes that never fucking land? Isn't it funny, guys? Aren't you laughing? Why aren't you laughing? You love Tina, don't you love Tina? Give Gearbox your money! You love Gearbox! They made handsome j- I sent a couple of cubs at the warden, and I'm just glad that the second one did damage quickly enough to skip this fight's gimmick. I love you, Wainwright. Farewell. I get one of the most heartfelt deliveries in the entire game, and it's an optional bit that you can just walk by without ever hearing. You force how much Calypso bullshit in my ears, and you leave Hammerlock's monologue as optional? Fuck you! What are your pants doing? What are you doing? I'm ambushed by Troy, who came here on his own. Clearly not accounting for the man, the myth, the fucking legend, Wainwright. He lets me escape to fight a big guy named Billy. Bigger target just means there's a lower chance of the cub missing, so it went by easily enough. 
would be nice if I could break it open for his stuff, but rules are rules and I have to ignore the rewards for killing anointed enemies. The game then introduces a walking catchphrase, and again, catchphrases don't make characters. And then have to help him with his side thing, and might I remind you that we're staring down the barrel of a Fate of the Universe issue. And he's worried about helping a town of maybe three people. Bigger fish, my dude. Credit where it's due, though, his voice work is fantastic. The best part, though, is that the game bugged out and I had to reload it. And I straight up didn't complete the objective, and the mission carried on as if I had. The game throws more new characters at you because depth and development scared the shit out of the team, I guess. So instead of making good personalities, they decided to make a lot of them. Also, celebrity cameos. Did you pay the writing team? Is that the problem? You hired too many voice actors and random famous people rather than paying the fucking writing team what they deserve? Honestly, I can't tell you how little I give a shit about some random ass AI and its toxic relationship with another AI. They have no bearing on anything else, and I just don't care. Ha ha ha, it's a dick joke! Laugh, everybody, laugh! It vaguely looks like the robot has a penis! Isn't just that the peak of comedy? Fuck you! Iron Cub, I'm begging you, get me the hell out of this nightmare. To Sanctuary, you say? Good, good! I had nothing better to do with my time than go through another loading screen. Right back to the same planet, you say? God fucking damn it! Back to helping NPCs you don't care about to accomplish things that hardly matter on a planet that I hate. There are invisible marks that you need to hit, which you can see using a gun that Quay gives you. But that uses a gun, so this part was a lot of trial and error. Got it in the end, though, so... Yay. Got another vault key fragment? Back to Sanctuary? Why not? Because I still had shit to do on the same planet? Well, you're damn right that I do! I just gotta get my fix of those two load screens first. Can't live without those! I made a real life from the pre-sequel, and no. No. Oh, no. You are not. Not now, not ever. You cold-hearted, silver spoon suppository having, two-dimensional, egotistical, fragile ego having dickhead. It's gonna be a warm day in that chess academy of yours before I let you lay another goddamn finger on the single best thing that this game has provided me in the last several hours of gameplay. You can hurt that couple when I stay dead and I respawn, bitch. Cub, teach her some lower tax bracket manners. From the bottom of my heart, fuck you. Right, this game was about vaults or something. Big, angry vault monster. Uh... Iron Cub struggles to target it with most of its attacks. It gets an augment though called My Little Friend that gives it an assault rifle that can target its arms when its attacks come in. So it was incredibly slow, but so was everything in this run. Not a huge deal as long as you're willing to wait for a shit ton of cooldowns. And you of course don't do something stupid like bounce on an enemy's head. Honestly, not 100% sure that I did here, but it wouldn't feel right if I did, so I restarted the fight. Tana set the power of the vault monster with her not siren powers, and then she gets kidnapped. You know what that means! That's right! Sanctuary, for some reason that's beyond me, and back to Pandora. Could've just fast traveled since this whole thing is time sensitive. Kidnapping and all. I have to use a car to shoot the bigger car until it stops moving, and now I'm questioning why so many important components to this massive vehicle are on the outside. On Pandora of all places. How has this crap not been busted up before? Again, with celebrities. I'm not saying they're giving bad performances, it's just odd. And probably not cost effective. Teller did give a dead on performance though. Now, the Agonizer 9000. A befitting name, as this was painful. So much trial and error went into this. So much experimentation. Most of its attacks are really easy to avoid. It sweeps the giant saw all the way around the field, which seems to be a guaranteed one shot on Iron Cub though. I ended up farming a lot of XP while brainstorming, and Iron Cub absolutely shreds through the boss. Which actually ended up being its own problem. See, the boss has up to about three stages as far as I can tell. Stage one isn't even worth talking about. Stage two is triggered once it's badly damaged, and it may or may not become invulnerable for a really long time. Afterwards, Iron Cub refuses to target the Agonizer. The stage can be avoided by doing enough damage, but that pushes it in Phase 3, where it gets a long invincibility period. Afterwards, Iron Cub refuses to target the Agonizer. In case I haven't made the problem clear, it'll just fucking stand there for the full duration refusing to do anything. If you do enough damage quickly enough, you more or less skip Phase 2, and enemies just don't spawn in. So you're set in an arena with a boss that won't move, with an AI companion that also won't move. I spent several hours over multiple days just figuring out this one boss. So, solution time. After several respecs and different builds, I found that I was most successful with an explosive build. Sometimes, when Iron Cub is trying to shoot an enemy, it'll accidentally deal damage to the boss. Two shots from the railgun would be enough, but across two days, I saw it hit the Agonizer with the railgun once. The grenade launcher with the lock and speed load added turns every shot into a five round burst. It makes the chance of missing the human enemies higher, thus increasing my chances of dealing some amount of damage to the Agonizer. For survival, it's best to only have one enemy spawn at a time. You can kill enemies by luring the Agonizer into lasering them. Since the Agonizer doesn't turn, and your mech won't usually move, you need to learn to lure enemies. Most enemies with guns will only follow you enough to get a clear shot, and try to get some distance from you. In those cases, you can just get within melee range and pop back out. 
they very slowly follow you, which is good enough for Iron Cub to get a shot off. Rinse and repeat until it eventually, fucking eventually, misses enough shots to destroy the fucking thing. By which I mean Tannis gets to actually break it. Meaning everything I did up until this point. The hours spent fighting this game's mechanics, the constant struggle that is the metric fuck ton of cooldowns I had to sit through. All of this could have been avoided had Iron Cub not been the only contributing member of the Raiders. The irony of my lack of action isn't lost on me. Also, despite Iron Cub not being able to target them, it can blow them up. Well, we did a total of one thing, which means we inevitably have to go back to Sanctuary. I know I'm harping on this, but this bugs the shit out of me. Why am I in this place so often? I hate the layout. There's no personality. This place sucks, and I want to see it less. I wanted to tell you, but these days being a siren puts a target on your back. And the twins have known about a shit ton of Iridian secrets that nobody else has really known about. As someone working with Tannis, you'd think it might be slightly important that I know that I'm standing in the splash zone of said target. Back to Pandora to finally attack the twins, which fails instantly due to a few turrets. I see no possible way that this could be dealt with. God forbid there are a few fucking turrets. I've dealt with nothing on the scale of a few fucking turrets. Remember when Tannis did this? Yeah, five minutes ago? She can control the technology, but not turn off a few automated guns because we have to pad the game time somehow, right? Yeah, apparently she needs to be boosted with Iridium to flip a switch. I got a driving section with a bunch of breakable terrain and enemies, so I ended up just running for most of it. Thrilling gameplay! It seems like you have to drive through certain checkpoints, though, so I had to drive extremely carefully. I used the mini nukes from my mech to clear out what I could. The blast radius is big enough that it helps when there are enemies nearby. And before you ask, no, the radius isn't big enough for the agonizer. Seriously, I, I tried. I tried damn near everything. This took a lot of careful movement, and longer than it should have, but I meant no damage. Not even random parts of the world. The game and I had a disagreement about necessary and unnecessary damage, though. I went to blow up this thing that I had to destroy to proceed, and the game crashed. Well, we accomplished basically nothing. Better go see what Lilith is up to! Nothing? Color me surprised! Pandora is a vault, and they're using Elpis to open it by way of charging the moon using Maya's powers despite her only learning to use Iridium just before her death. He can just kind of do it, because fuck continuity. But also, Elpis also had a vault. They put a vault in a key for a vault. Okay. Iron Cub rips its way through the defenses of these fucking clowns, and Ava's here? Seriously, she's a fucking toddler. What the fuck is Ava doing here? Why? Just why is she here? She's literally only served to prove how badly she needs to not be on the battlefield with us, and you put her here. This is supposed to be some big climactic battle with voice lines from a bunch of people you've met along the way, but here's past gave us Brick and Mordecai. This place gave us Ava. Do you see the problem? After Angel spent the majority of her life charging a vault key, Troy basically charged it in what? Less than a day? Not just a normal key, mind you, it's a key to the Great Vault. Unless we forget a friggin' moon! Ever since the Swamp Planet of Eden 6, the game has been teasing a rivalry and almost hatred for one another between the twins. Troy's been coming into his own without her, and he's even acting against her wishes, indicating that he's going to start charting his own course. Maybe finally add a single bit of character development past her shadow. He's powerful enough to charge Elpis. He must be terrifyingly powerful then, right? Wrong! The only times, the only fucking times that he wasn't absolutely melting, he was invulnerable. As soon as those iframes were gone, so too was his health. He died as he lived. Like a little bitch. Ava is a siren now, I guess. She's also given the vault key. That totally felt earned, and not at all like a slap in the face, gut, and brain. Tyrene is down. Being experienced vault hunters, they of course double tap. Double tap! You dumb fucks! Double goddamn- Oh, so the whole climactic battle was a fake out. Because you wanted to make the game run even longer. Gotta pad the runtime somehow! On a lighter note, Iron Cub wasn't visible for the cutscene for obvious reasons, but they didn't do anything to hide his thrusters. It's just running through so many scenes that are supposed to be important, impactful, dramatic, and what have you, but it's clearly right there. Just look at him! Look at the little guy go! Ava has somehow basically mastered the powers that Gearbox stole from Maya, and we have to go to Sanctuary, where the game broke. I guess I pressed a thing too quickly, and it wouldn't let me proceed without resetting the game. Because this game was put together with a moldy cheese sandwich and zero fucks to be given. And we're off to the Iridian homeworld, or something. I don't know, this game was dragging on a while ago. But here we are. And this whole place is bland as fuck. Also, the first vault hunter is here. The big issue, though, is that I don't care. Why the fuck would I care who the first vault hunter was? It was literally never a concern of mine until this very game. You suddenly expect me to care? The first game makes it seem like there's only one vault in general. Even then, it was thought to be a myth. But apparently, there have been vaults everywhere for forever, with multiple opened, and there are sirens running all over the place. And I just don't care. This game doesn't feel like it gives half a flying fuck about the lore, so why should I? After accomplishing fuck all, you guessed it, 
This is why Brick left, isn't it? Isn't it? And then back to Necrota, who gives a shit? We try to use the machine to seal away the vault, and Tyrene actually does something for the first time since she took Lilith's powers. I had reset the mission twice to be able to actually fucking finish. It kept glitching, leaving me with a kill objective and nothing left alive. Third time's the charm, I guess. The antagonist finally shows up. Typhon's big claim to fame is more or less just finding a bunch of vaults. Woo, goddamn who. You know what else he did? He fucking died. Don't be the last vault hunters. We need them to break even this quarter. Also, Gearbox ironically decided to not release any more vault hunters for this game. Yeah, 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 they're research and focus groups and whatnot. But Krieg and Gage, the DLC vault hunters, were some of the most fun to play in the game. And they couldn't be bothered to make new ones. Wow. Then comes the final boss, I guess. Yeah. Her ultimate power? Godlike to control the universe? She becomes whatever the hell this is and completely forgets how to use any of her powers in any meaningful way. What falls is a really mediocre bullet hell while Iron Cub tears the ever-loving shit out of her health. It apparently can't target her with homing rockets, but it can with its minigun. It wastes a lot of fuel during her incredibly long and frequent invulnerability phases. But if you can wait out the cooldown, you can stomp this sorry excuse for an end boss. There, I did it. Lilith throws herself into the moon, the plot acts like either she or Ava have earned this scene, and it plays out, this girl's on fire. I love a bad pun probably more than the next person, but this was a terrible song to end out on for a series that generally has some great picks. Also, she leaves Sanctuary to Ava? Ava? Not any of the people that have fought with her, bled with her, damn near given their lives to protect her. Fucking Ava. Despite everything, I think this game is genuinely fun. The worst part is that it's genuinely fun with the worst writing in the series. I just wish the story didn't happen. The world is a better place if this shit stain isn't canon. Can Borderlands 4 just be a retcon of this entire game? Because hot damn, this was... This was just so fucking bad! So good job, applause all around. Iron Cub has successfully beaten Borderlands 3. I'm gonna go have a lie down. I hope you enjoyed your time here. More than I enjoyed mine at the very least. You probably know how to use social media, and I hope that means I'll get to hear your thoughts now and on in future outings. Until then, remember to stay safe, spread some kindness in the world, and I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye.